All right. All right, one to the two, two to the three, and the place to be. Welcome to the Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review. I am BQ. I've also got Adam in the place to be, and we're talking the latest episode of Impact Wrestling. Please hit subscribe regardless of whatever platform you're listening on. If you're listening on YouTube and you kind of prefer a streaming format, well, we're on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, pretty much anywhere that you stream your podcast. So definitely check that out. Check out the homies over at the Heel Cast. They've been doing some really good things uh, covering Impact as well re recently. And if you are listening on YouTube and you click it at the description, a real easy way to support the show is to download the Fight app and uh, create a profile. You don't have to purchase anything. Just download, create a profile, and you'll actually be supporting the show. Very easy way, very cool way. So uh, would appreciate any help out with that. So Adam, let's get into um, Impact once again, just like we do every week and you know talking to you offline here a little bit i know you said you don't it didn't seem like the show really uh stuck with you a whole lot uh overall you know i thought it was actually a pretty good show i thought they got back on track um, probably not anything you know phenomenal on the show but very very solid and i thought they got back on track after that thanksgiving episode which i i thought was was not good um but ever since they've been in canada it's been good uh, much bigger crowd, much louder crowd with this one, and I, you know, of course we know they they paid a few people, but um, you know, from what I understand, it wasn't it wasn't they didn't really cast that many people over the week, so um, just just a larger, more engaged crowd, and um, yeah, let's let's get into it. Let's um let's get into the first match of the evening, and this is the knockouts title match, Laura Venice versus Madison Rain and Casey Spinelli. First thing I want to ask you, I covered this on the YouTube channel. Did did you feel like the the brackets were a little uh <laughs> lopsided? Yeah. That is the word you're grasping for. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you look at the the other side of it, it's uh three champs, three former champs, I believe. Um and then on this side, yeah, you've got uh yeah, not three former champs. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. It was lopsided, but having said that, I think this was possibly one of the matches of the night. I thought it was really good. It was a really great start to the show. Uh, it was some stiff wrestling in there as well, which you're not used to seeing. And it and it wasn't. Uh, there was some weird moves in it. Like the, there was one where it was almost like a shoulder barge or a shoulder block or something like that that Casey Spinelli did on uh, Laura Van Ness, and she went down hard. Uh, and it was a few times where I was watching it, I was thinking, "Wow, that hurt." Uh, but it was good. It was really good. Really enjoyed it. I did too, and you know, going back to the previous point about it maybe being a little bit lopsided, I'm pretty sure Taya was probably supposed to hold that slot down where Madison Rain was. Um, I think Madison Rain happened to be in country because she's married to Josh Matthews, obviously, and um, you know, I think that's basically <laughs> how she's there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put too much uh, stock in it as far as seeing her in the future. It was nice to see the heel Madison Rain and the Killer Queen music and all that, like really good. And I kind of enjoyed the segment. Um, beforehand where, the, where JB was talking to all of them and you just see the six standing there and they just they're all kind of just doing their own six individual gimmicks and I, I don't know I just I, I thought that was kind of cool um, but agreed I thought the match was, was pretty good um, I would have reworked the brackets if, if that was the case and um, we did have a former knockouts champion in Madison Rain there but with you know Casey being new um, she obviously should have been uh, on a side, you know, maybe swap her out with uh, with uh, Sienna or something like that. So, kind of weird, kind of lopsided, but yes, uh, pretty good match. I thought it was one of the more solid knockouts matches we'd seen in a little while. And I think Casey Spinelli has some um, some promise, and I've been familiar with her for a long time. So, glad to see her aboard, and uh, kind of good to see Laurel, uh, the character growing in her. You know, uh, her actually wrestling a little bit. You know, she's still st staying true to the gimmick, but it's not, you know, it's not silly. And I don't, I don't know if she did the stumble in the ring that she normally does, which I usually think is funny, but uh, didn't catch if she did that. Yeah, I, I mean, I thought she looked great, and I like the new look. Don't get me wrong, I thought she was great when she's in the wedding dress, but obviously you've got to move on from that. And yeah, it, it's a tweak to the character, but yeah, she, she's excellent, and I, I thought she looked fantastic in the match as well. They all look really good. Casey Spinelli as well, you know, got a lot of offense in there. And, and Madison Rain being, I'm guessing, the biggest, from a, a legacy point of view, name in that match, uh, wasn't booked in, in any dominant fashion at all. So it was good. It was really good. And 
I think it was the right winner at this point, although it's been a shame that we haven't really seen Laurel Van Ness in a long while in a wrestling wing, wing ring even. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so it was good to see her get the win. Really, really pleased with the match. And, and as I said, I thought it was an excellent way to kick off the show. Really good. Yeah, I thought so as well. And, um, yeah, Laurel, we would have liked to see her maybe win some matches up to this. You know, um, it's kind of unfortunate that this actually wasn't in Orlando because they could have done a lot more with the knockouts. Um, probably could have brought in some local competitors, could have had Ava's story out there. And, um, you know, there was just, they could have probably done a full-fledged tournament fairly easily. But this is kind of what they had to work with in Canada, which is, is still cool. I mean, two, uh, two matches leading to a final. And, um... Uh, you know, it was a shade under six minutes, so it wasn't like they got the most time in the world, but still pretty enjoyable. Laurel Van Ness with the win. And I did like the way she won the match. Um, I, I don't know if Casey Spinelli was going for a finisher because I'm not quite sure what hers is, but it looked like she was possibly going for something like that. Laurel um, reversed it and hit her finisher, and I'd like to see her stick with that um, on Impact Television because I think the curb stomp looks like crap. Just, just on that note about her finish, I think it's is it the unprettier or it's the one that Christian Cage used to do, isn't it? So, yeah. I, I, and to me, I've always hated that finisher personally. It's just it looks so awkward and doesn't look real, you know, in a real context. It doesn't look like that you could actually do that move because someone would would break out of it very very easily. But but having said that, in the context of this match, she turned uh, the finisher around from Casey Pacelli very very quickly, so it did look authentic but to me it's not my favorite finisher in the world i'll be honest i dig the finisher but i do understand what you're saying like that whole when she you know christian cage did the same thing when you're locking it in and it's taking like half an hour to turn the person around i mean <laughs> exactly yeah, that, yeah that's exactly the point yeah yeah so uh but yeah but uh, as you said it, I, I thought the finish was good and i thought the whole match was, was, was just excellent and you said it's six minutes long it's funny i don't always pay attention to how long these things were but it was fast paced and it didn't seem like a short match but obviously you're telling me it seemed like they had a good match, all of them, you know, and it worked well. It didn't drag. It was good. Really good. Ishimori took on Hakeem Zane. Hakeem Zayn was the winner of Global Forged. And I enjoyed the, you know, the match. I thought Hakeem Zane showed some promise. I would have liked to see a little bit more offense. Um, but I think that I think people can see that he can really work and he's going to be a good heel for the X Division. Uh, you know, the match aside, though, because um, obviously, well, T Ishimori wins the match, and Trevor Lee and Caleb Conley come down, and basically they're they're building an angle. Obviously, they're trying to build up towards Ishimori challenging for the X Division title. You know, he won the match with Tyson Dukes at Bound for Glory. They said it had X Division implications. I thought that was just something they said, but apparently, it kind of does. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, he was their tag team partner in a match. It was very random. You know, they kind of played like there was miscues, but they didn't, you know, they, they didn't play to it very strongly, in my opinion. But um, I guess my, my issue with the match was that it was obviously built for Ishimori to to uh, move on and, and um, cha challenge for the title. I just, I guess I would have rather he got this win against Caleb Conley um, other than Hakeem Zayn, who this is, you know, basically his debut match. I mean, he wrestled in a tag match, a couple, you know, one night only, which was competitive. Wrestled on Impact one time, but him and uh, Abraham got squashed by the Veterans of War, I believe. So uh, I, I don't know if I would have put this. You know, it's Hakeem Zayn's first match. It would have kind of like kind of been cool to kind of see him get a win, um, but he kind of got that. He didn't. It wasn't like a jobber thing, but he had a thing where he, you know, it's his debut match. He loses, and there's there's um, a storyline that carries on after it that has nothing to do with him. So he was the least and some least um, significant part of the match. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree, and and, and I, I have a problem sometimes how uh, Impact have booked the winners of these. I want to say reality shows. You know, British Boot Camp before that, Mandrews. I can't even remember him getting either a storyline or a win. Uh, Spud, I know later on he became more of a character, but once again, he was never booked as a credible wrestler. And I know those two were, were smaller guys. Hakeem Zayn isn't. But you want someone to come in and, and actually just as opposed to be a, a, you know enhancement talent, as he said, you want them to have a proper storyline because they've built up, well, I was going to say they've built up a fan base. At least they've got some backstory that they can go to. 
Uh, and it just seems such a waste to bring him in on a storyline. I don't know. that It seems just lost in the mix. You know, it's nothing. His debut was a loss to someone who's in a mid-card storyline, which is not that exciting, if I'm being honest. So uh, it was a strange bit of booking to me. But at least, as you said, he, he didn't come across as a jobber. You know, he, he got some of, uh, some offence in there, which is good. Right. So um, I, ho- hopefully we'll see, you know, better matches in the future that feature him where he can really show what he can do. And he wrestles locally here quite a bit. Um, and I've talked to him a little bit and, and I'm a big fan of his and he's got a lot of talent. Uh, but Ishimori does get the win. Looks like they're positioning him for a run at the X Division Championship. We get the uh, backstage promo, James Storm. Again, James Storm. I don't know if it's because he knew he was leaving the company or what <laughs> what's going on, but he is, his, um, he's definitely trying to go out with a bang because he's a uh, promo he's been cutting. Uh, good. And uh, talking about his match, upcoming match with Tejano. So at least we finally, we, we actually uh, built towards a match between the two. You know, the whole cowboy versus cowboy thing. I thought after Bound for Glory they might drop it. Wasn't exactly sure. Um, LAX at the clubhouse. I, I thought Homicide was talking way too much here and I didn't realize homicide doesn't talk as well as the uh the other guys so the whole segment came off a little disjointed to me but um it's good to see him actually have a role in this whole LAX thing instead of just kind of being a henchman like now he's he's basically one of the three big names and um talking about Callahan and OBE and they kind of pumped this up that this was going to be you know kind of something special it was just a backstage segment it was it was nothing uh Nothing really to talk about. Um, anything on that at all, uh, w- whether it be the James Storm backstage segment or the uh, LAX Clubhouse segment? Yeah, yeah. I- I'm sure we'll come on back on to James Storm in a sec because we'll talk about the match. Um, but yeah, the-, the-, the segment was good. And I also like the-, the evolution of-, of his look as well because I-, I felt for a long time that he's been too stuck in almost like an 80s cowboy look. Uh, with what he was wearing and it looked much more modern and fashionable I know he's you know he's potentially leaving in a couple of weeks time and leaving the company those kind of things but it's nice to see that he hasn't just stuck with the same stuff he, he looked look fresher but yeah I quite enjoyed the promo the clubhouse stuff yeah it, it, it's hard because obviously they're trying to transition LAX into I don't want to say baby faces but certainly tweener baby faces you know kind of kind of roles so the promo was fine uh, it annoys me that Conan's still rolling out the same lines you know we're more serious than a late period or whatever it was you know it's about time you got some fresh material but I, I like LAX I can't really complain too much about it yeah when, when LAX first came back on the scene in Impact and he was cutting those promos in the ring I mean it was like oh man you know this guy's got a silver tongue he's just saying you know just incredible stuff and he, he's going back to the ovaries and everything it's um, you know I kind of talked about bad humor on the last on the, on the last episode and I don't I don't want to put him in a category of bad humor by any means, but also bad humor is when you say something funny and you do tell a good joke and then you keep uh, keep going back to that well as much as possible and then just absolutely kill it. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully I, I know he's capable of saying some new stuff. So <laughs> hopefully we get that, get that here. He was. He was great on the teleconference that he did. I, I really like him as a person. Uh, I know he's not everyone's favourite, but he was really good on the teleconference. Um, one thing that giving Homicide a bit of mic time, well, not mic time, but backstage time, was that uh, Tito and Santana um, uh, are kind of been lost for <laughs> Tito. Or t- oh, Tito. <laughs> <laughs> Hariba. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I realized where I went wrong there as soon as I said it. Uh, yeah, but they seem to have kind of been lost in the, in the mix a little bit at the moment. Uh, you know, they've since they've lost the titles, you haven't really seen much of them, certainly not in the backstage. And you, you would want to see them being angry backstage because they were teasing. Uh, I can't remember if it was Ortiz or not. Um, have a bit of dissension in the group, and that's kind of disappeared again. I don't know if you've noticed that. Yeah, you're right. Um I think maybe they had done that just to kind of throw us off when they were trying to do the double turn. That's all I can yeah, think Yeah, possibly. Of. Yeah. But, you know, I, I think, you know, they're, they're cracking talent. Um, so hopefully, you know, that feud will pick back up. And I know, uh, you know, this is not spoiler thing, but I, I know there's in this set of tapings, there's a match of the year contender by all accounts coming up with these lots. So, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully they'll get back on telly with some good presence soon. Sammy Callahan. 
um, Defy Wrestling match. They are a new partner for the Global Wrestling app versus Randy Myers. And it's crazy how much, you know, talking about the Global Wrestling app for a second, or the Global Wrestling Network, I should say, how little um, coverage the wrestling media gives us when they're really doing some, some. Uh, I, mean, I mean, they need to do more with their own programming and their more, you know, more original programming for them. But these partnerships are actually um, what professional wrestling is all about. I mean, these companies working together, um, and and it seems like it's cool to kill off companies, but but to help companies grow it or work together is is not as sexy for some reason to people. Um, and and pe it's people just prefer the drama over um, you know negativity over the positivity. And to even go to the Hardy's thing here for a second, uh, you know when when Impact or Anthem was keeping the gimmick away from them, I mean, it was all anyone could talk about for weeks and it was fuck that owl and it was negativity. Now they're like, okay, we're going to restructure contracts. You can have it back. Now it's absolute crickets on social media. Um, and it doesn't even seem like anybody cares from what I've seen. Like the, even the fans that want to see it, they're just, oh, okay, cool. Mm. I guess we're going to see the broken hearties. I know what you mean. It does seem strange that something which is so positive for pro wrestling as an industry, as you say, isn't getting much coverage. And I don't know if that's the fault of impact in that they're not promoting it enough with the dirt sheets. Because to be fair, the dirt sheets are quite lazy. They are lazy. They pick up one person will pick up a story, then everyone runs with it. You know, and it's only if things get mentioned by Meltz or someone like that, but everyone picks up on it on the other dirt sheets. You know, I, I, and I know myself, having done lots of interviews in the past, you know, if you send them out the audio, they won't publish it. But if you do a transcript and send them out highlights, every single one of them will publish it. It's because there's nothing against dirt sheets, but they're just generally lazy. Because, it, you know, I, I'm guessing it's because people have proper jobs and, you know, running a wrestling dirt sheet is not something that's going to pay the bills. So it's something that's a, 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 you know, a passion almost. So I think that's maybe why, you know, maybe if Impact promoted it more and sent out more press releases, I, d I don't know, uh, maybe even the, the wrestling promotions themselves. I, I don't know. You never really see, for example, Border City Wrestling mentioned on WrestleZone or WrestleLink or whatever, do you? You never see the spoilers on their shows. Uh, and maybe that's because these guys don't know how to work the media so well. Um uh, and that's what we're, that's why we're about, because we know how to, to work the media, you know, and get things out there and those kind of things. So um, a long winded way. You're quite right, though. It should be publicized more uh, because it is positive for the industry and anything that's positive for the industry should be applauded and should be promoted. And uh, it's great that they get these things. Hopefully they'll get a bit more of a global feel very sh soon on it, you know, and get some British shows. I know we have some fantastic uh, promotions over here in the UK, you know, and I'm sure it's the same all around the world. And to get some of that content on there would be brilliant. Yeah, the, and the big thing is when they are they able to finally get the AAA crash no on there. That that's what's going to be a real big selling point. But the company's promotion and marketing has always been horrendous. Um, you know, there's been some improvements. There were some improvements when Jeff Jarrett uh, came back aboard, but overall, the promotion and marketing has been really really poor by the company for a long time. But I do like we know we're going to get to the match here in a second. How they made it a point to say, hey, this this is a new partner with the global wrestling network. Um, and then they, you know, even though they do the, uh, the Pluto clip, they also do, um, you know, the throwback. I don't know what the hell they call it, but you know, they showed us the match of Kurt Angle and Samoa Joe, um, which was actually, actually pretty cool to see again. Um, you know, but they're, they are promoting it to an extent fairly well on the television show. And if you remember back when the, uh, WWE network first came out, instead of uh promoting that and hey this is the content on it this and this they were just doing silly marketing schemes of 9.99 and uh it became more annoying than anything and they were selling people on the price point instead of the content so this is something they're they're doing better where they're selling people on on the content i just i have to wonder what the you know the the, the um the benefit is for the the uh partners as far as these smaller companies um because there's a free version of the app, and anytime you have a free version, you know you you make your money off ads and everything. Uh, so I don't, you know, I would imagine it to get, but I'm sure they're willing to take whatever. Um, I just don't want to see them partner with so many people that they have a hard time uh, making money off the app. If you understand what I mean. 
Yeah, ex- exactly. I mean, the, the more that you pay away to each of the the, the partners, the less the impact's going to make. And, <clears throat> you know, it dilutes the message. But at the same time, it's bigger than content. So the only way it can go eventually is for the price to go up. And I think that if they get enough uh, partners on there, that they're, they're, you know, it, it could go up and people would subscribe. So Sammy Callahan takes on Randy Myers. Now, Sammy Callahan is the impact talent here. And... Um, and this is this is where sometimes there sometimes it hits sometimes it misses um, because they're taping the match for Impact Television but they're not following um, you know Impact's wishes or Impact storylines or whatever so it starts off with Randy Myers kind of doing the couple you know putting the the palm up kind of like Garza Jr. does so immediately it just made Sammy Callahan look like the challenger like the you know like the lesser talent you know just right off the bat so. Um, that's something I, I didn't really care for, but the match for what it was, you know, it was, it was a four minutes of, of clips and everything. Pretty good. Good to see Sammy Callahan out there. That was, uh, the crowd was very into it. Sometimes I feel a little indifferent when you see a crowd so into it and then you go back to the impact zone and it's like, <laughs> okay, cool. Wrestling's on. But with that being said, I, I thought this Ottawa crowd was, was really good and really engaged. I mean, the last, the last one was. It was just a smaller crowd, but just to pick up on something you said there, if you don't mind, going back to the crowd reaction, seeing a crowd so into it, and then going back to you know um, the Impact Zone or, or up in Ottawa, that was one of the things that struck out at me at um, the Joe versus Angle match is how the crowd were loving it, and you know that proper TNA crowd as it was back then were just so bored into it, and I think that it's also being sold. Uh, so well by Don West, who I miss so much as a, as a commentator. Uh, I know not many people share my, my feelings on that one. But, um, yeah, that, that was, once again, the same with, with the Sammy Callahan thing. You see the crowd and they're so into it. Uh, it. It does then take you back out of it when you get a bigger crowd, but not so into it <laughs> when you come back to the, well, not the impact zone, the Canada zone, whatever it's called. Yeah, it's funny. Um, you brought up the commentary. So I I actually do kind of like josh matthews and jb's commentary I, I know i'm not against it like some people are but I, at the same time i don't think it, it's like the greatest commentary in the world i don't think a single wrestling show or promotion has a good commentary team i really don't um there's there's they might have you know someone who's really good at play-by-play or good color guy but i don't think there's one commentary team in wrestling where it's just um all all three guys or both guys are just really solid I just I that's my personal opinion, but um, to hear this and to hear the the, the conviction in um, Don West's voice and everything and Mike Tenay, man, like that that is missing from this product, um, especially mm. with this episode. It, you know, just like oh, okay, this and this is happening. Um, Josh and JB definitely don't have um, that same passion with their voice, even though I do think they do a good job, but. Did you notice Josh Matthews is starting to kind of flip back, you know, because he was the, the heel commentary for a while, and now mm. it's like he's doing this tweener thing, which I hate. I hate when um, play by play, or color guys do the tweener thing where they don't know who they're cheering for. But um, it, we'll get it. To, I mean, this happened more so in the main event. That's where it like really stood out to me where he's like, oh, you know, Patron son of a bitch. And he was um, – th- there was another heel – in one of the other matches, I, I don't remember exactly um, that he was kind of turning against. It might I, I don't remember who it was, but I mean, did you catch this with Josh Matthews that he's either going back to the baby face or or maybe tween you know tweener or yeah, there was an element of that. Certainly, as you said, it was much more noticeable in the main event. Um, you know, and I, I can understand why they're doing it, uh, especially with. Alberto, because they're trying to get him to be, you know, uh, the big bad heel. And it's got to be sold on commentary. It really does have to be sold on commentary. And I, I think the problem is, is that although um, Jeremy Borash has been brilliant for the company, I just don't think he's that good a commentator. Uh, and that's the problem. And I don't think that he's good enough to sell how evil Alberto is supposed to be. So which is why they've gone back to this Josh thing. I, I sorry to, to go back to, to, you know, just talking about commentary again. I, I think it's been a problem in, in impact for a long, long time uh, since Don West left. That I, you know, Mike Tanay with Taz didn't really work for me that well either. I, I thought Taz at times was genuinely awful. 
I, I think he was awful. I think, but I think, um, uh, who's the current guy? I can't think of his name. The Pope? <laughs> no, um, Je- um, not Jeremy Borash, the other one. No, Josh Matthews. Yeah, Josh Matthews, yeah, I completely lost my chain of thought there. You know, I, I think he's all right at times. I don't mind him so much, uh, but it, you've got to put two good people together, you know. Bobby the Brain wasn't brilliant because of, of who he was. It's because he was with Gorilla Monsoon, you know. And it's the same. It's the same. Jr. Because he was with Jerry Lawler or Michael Cole. You know that you need someone good to play off. And at the moment, I just don't think that Josh Matthews is good enough uh, to. No, sorry, Jeremy Borash isn't good enough to help Josh Matthews bounce off him. You know, and back in the day, as I, I was saying, that um, Bobby the Brain Heenan bounced off Gorilla Monsoon. You know, Jr. Always had Lawler to bounce off. And at the moment, we don't have someone that Josh can bounce off who's any good. And that's the problem that we have with the commentary team. It'd actually be interesting to see, and I'm sorry to do this to you, PQ, but it will be good to see in the comments when you listen to this, who you think has been the best commentary team and what you think of them. Because, you know, I think that's one of the biggest problems with the product at the moment. To go off completely off tangent here is that when you look back at that Angle versus Joe thing, the reason why Don West sounded so good is because of the noise of the crowd behind him. They were getting they were getting excited as well. It's the same as when JR shouting about, by God, he's been broken in half. The crowd is screaming in the background and it's hard to elicit, oh my God, what's that son of a bitch doing if the crowd are pretty indifferent to the product? Uh, and I think you can fake that with background editing of you know, the sound. And, and I think it's the post-production and, and, and the commentary at the moment that are affecting the product more than anything else. I think if they could get that right, the product would seem so much better. Yeah, it seemed a lot bigger. And the thing with commentary, it's not about being a good play-by-play or good color guy. It is about uh, chemistry. And I and I always said that I didn't think the Pope and J- and Josh had the best chemistry in the world. But it's all chemistry. You brought up Bobby the Brain. Him and Gorilla Monsoon have the best chemistry of any, um, in my opinion, any play-by-play team in the history of professional wrestling. And then you brought up JR and Lawler. So... I remember it was about three years ago when I still had um, the network. I was uh, I, w- I was watching all the WrestleManias up till up till I kind of stopped caring. Um, there there was a point in the '90s where it started getting real bad, but you know I was watching all the like '80s WrestleManias and uh, some of the early '90s stuff. And there was a um, it might have been like WrestleMania nine, and it was uh, Jr. and Heenan on commentary for the first time, the two of them together awful absolutely terrible you're talking about the best color guy ever the best play-by-play guy ever awful the two of them were terrible so um it has to do with with chemistry quite a bit so um josh and jb it's it's just not there's not a consistency you know what are you guys what are we gonna do but i think you make a really good point that the crowd does play a big role in that um you know so we've been talking about this for a while here, so uh, we'll move on. But Sammy Callahan does get the win over Randy Myers, who seems to be uh, pretty over with that local crowd. Uh, but I quite like Randy Myers, by the way. From the little bit I saw of him, he looked quite a good talent, and he had a good look and something quite interesting there. Hopefully, you know, we'll see him again. Yeah, totally agree with you. Mackenzie Mitchell and El Patron backstage. I thought uh, El Patron did a good job here. I think he was talking a little bit long for my taste, but I thought I thought it was. Um, I thought it was a pretty decent job. Uh, then we see KM backstage. He's um, he's beating <laughs> he's beating someone down. And uh, I, at first, because I, I had to watch on my phone, uh, my DVR did not only record the main event, so I had to stream it on my phone. And um, he, you know, it looked like he was hitting a backstage official, backstage guy, whatever. And then you know, hit another one, throw him across the table. I actually have interest in this because. It get it gets uh, like as I've said as I've said gets KM away from the comedy a little bit and I want to see where they go with you know a more serious KM who is obviously trying to um, impress American's top team I don't see them uh, enlisting him into the group so I, I do have interest in um, you know where they're going with it I mean does this interest you at all or are you just kind of like whatever No no it does I, I mean I've, I've said from day one I like KM uh, he's he's good and. Uh... Uh, and yeah, at least they're giving him something to do. And it's moving him away from Sienna as well, so she can go and do her own thing. 
Um, but yeah, you know, I don't know where the storyline's going, but I like backstage segments like this. You know, it's, it's a shame that almost it's not outside of. I keep wanting to say the impact zone outside of, uh, you know, the the backstage area. It would be good if he was doing other things to prove himself out on the streets as well, just to get out of the arena now and again. And he's the kind of character who can pull off, you know, the these kind of uh, crazy storylines that you got. But no, I, I'm interested in where it goes. Absolutely. Um, and I'm glad that he's got something to do. I like that he went to um, <laughs> try to go to ATT afterwards. Um, I think J- James Storm called him AAT when he was talking. But um, I like that he went to him and, do you see that? Do you see that? He's like, we just got here. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> I, do, do you know um, when, when this ATT uh, American Top Team stuff started? I, I didn't like it, but it, it, it's getting better week upon week. I mean, Dan Lambert. I, I'm even enjoying the guy, the other ma- um, managers in the neck brace. You know, even he's grown on me. That they've all grown on me. It's been good. It's been good. Yeah, Josh Matthews has a hard on for Colby Covington. That's uh, that's one thing that's been very apparent in all this. Oh my lord. Um, I want to say about the backstage segments, I kind of enjoy the Mackenzie Mitchell backstage thing. Um, one thing I did not, I've never really liked about even the early days of TNA and the, the glory years, I never liked the uh, backstage segments where two, uh, they were kind of in the dark in the impact zone and, you know, two guys were just talking and there was the shaky cam and, you know, I, I was never into those. Um, I, I do kind of just like, backstage um like backstage interviews um i like them to be quick i don't think they should be long but it kind of helps to have someone just asking the questions instead of the wrestlers relying on um their own actors acting skills to get over but i don't mean with that secret cameraman that's just lurking you know with the crack door filming Bish- bischoff and hogan talking yeah I-, I can do with that that as well uh james storm versus tejano and this was a pretty, actually, pretty solid uh, match. Um, you know, just two two big guys going back and forth. And you talked about James Storm's updated look. I, I really like the updated version of the uh, Long Necks and Red Necks song. Um, it's going to be unfortunate to to see him gone. So we're you know kind of seeing the uh, the final days of James Storm here. Uh, kind of sucks, but pretty decent match. And uh, I'm, I've never been a Tejano fan. Uh, you know, watch him on Lucha Underground and everything. Just n- not really into him, but um, they did. They, they worked well together, and I think what I liked was Tejano hitting that uh, super kick at one point. You know, kind of taking a play out of his book. But I, I really liked the end of the match, the uh, finish. I thought that was kind of it wasn't dramatic or anything, but actually, I guess I kind of got a kick out of it, like it was funny. But um, yeah, what you got on this one? Yeah, I, I, I thought it was a really good match actually. Um, and the other thing. As you said, Tahano, uh, to me, uh, an absolute charisma vacuum. You know, any segment or wrestling match he's been in, instantly my interest level you know, drops through the floor. But this was really good. This is the best match he, he's been in since he's been in Impact. Um, and, yeah, I really enjoyed the match. And, and once again, Storm, uh, you know, he's at the tail end of his career, but he's putting on some of the best matches on Impact week, week in, week out. And same with the promos. Absolutely. He just has a fire and passion that... You know these these young guys really need to really need to pick up on. So after the match, um, and, and I've said many times, I hate when there there's a post match beat down and then the, but the the match itself is like two or three minutes long. Like we got twice where Easy Mori versus Zane, they had a decent match, and then there was a post match you know storyline angle, and then with this one too. So we got a decent match, and then. Uh, got the angle so that's what i was asking for a decent match and then further a storyline not not one of the two so um america's hot team comes down attacking james storm and um man i i that was one of my funny the my favorite parts what i thought was the funniest parts of the evening you know the little guy who's a manager with the neck brace where he's just like i got this i got this my wife i think he said my <laughs> wife or my mom watches this program <laughs> and then he just <laughs> He gets actually, uh, it was a super kick, wasn't it? Oh, God, last, last call. Yeah. To the face. Oh, hilarious. You know, and James Storm always says, you know, people, I, I kick through people with my with my super kick. And there was an independent show locally I went to. I went to because James Storm was there. It was a benefit for uh, her, um, hurricane relief. And, uh, 
you know, it was it was mainly real local guys, but James Storm made an appearance, and he was like a mystery tag team partner in a in a in a tag tag match. So he wins a match ultimately with the last call, and but the guy he kicks is like about the same size as that dude, um, and just to see it in person where he just kicks someone's head off, and this guy's just an average dude. I'm like, um, I was like, oh my god, these poor guys, and. Uh, I'm I'm sure that you know Brace he was wearing took some of the impact, but pretty pretty freaking funny, and um, they beat down again. Uh, Josh Matthews continues to get excited about Colby Covington in the ring, and uh, Moose comes down. Uh, probably could have come down a little quicker. Uh, with- well, that I was going to say that it was the most lackluster running save I've ever seen. I, I mean, it was dreadful, and even when he came in, it was like he was half-hearted swinging the chair. Yeah, <laughs> it was terrible. It was, it was almost like I don't really want to do this. It, I was watching a good TV show backstage. I've got to go down now. Why, you know? So <laughs> carry on. Anyway, interrupted across you there. No, you're fine. That that's actually something I've um, talked about for a good couple of years now, um, since I start covering Impact. Is the the run-ins and you know people coming in, the baby faces coming down and not having a uh, head of steam. I mean, I remember. Um, EC3 when he turned babyface coming down a couple times walking real slow. Uh, I remember one with Shira coming to save uh, Al Snow at one point, and he was just walking as slow as humanly possible. Um, I, don't, I don't know why James Storm did it a few uh, weeks ago when he was saving EC3 and Eddie Edwards. He came down with the beer and he was just just strolling. So really weird that they do that. Um, I don't know what they're trying to achieve. Uh, by doing that obviously that's something they, they do on purpose um, but it, it just doesn't look good so Dan Lambert again is just continues to steal the show every time he gets the mic and um, he challenged Storm and Moose next week uh, against Lashley and himself so of course the re- rest of American's top team and King Mo and all them were like what the hell are you talking about like what are you doing in the ring so this has been a good storyline this um this pussy Ryan Satin uh, one of my least favorite dirt sheet writers, you know, he really spoiled a lot about this match and everything. And, um, you know, talking about James Storm doesn't deserve to be in a match with a manager at the end of his career and everything. And, um, he's, he's just an idiot. You know, they, they've built up to this really well. And I think they've done a better job building up to this than the whole bound for glory angle with, uh, Moose and, um, Stefan Bonner. I mean, I think just just the since Bound for Glory, the American Top Team, and James Storm has been has had way more steam than that ever did. You're absolutely right. And one of the things now that when I reflect back on since Bound for Glory, is there doesn't actually seem to be that many storylines on the go at the moment. There's some feuds going on, but there doesn't seem to be much, you know, in the way of progressing storylines. I suppose you got Alberto and Johnny Impact. But Eli Drake seems to be drifting. Trevor Lee seems to be drifting. EC3 is randomly called out Sadal. You know, and that storyline really isn't going very far, very quickly. And it just seems that, you know, the, the only one really good storyline, which I think has kept up its head of steam, is this one. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, the, the, the matches, this this night had a lot of wrestling in it. Very little storyline, very little cre- I mean, there was storyline, don't get me wrong, but... Um, Lots of focus on on the in ring, and I, I really like the way the show is formatted. I thought it went really um, smooth. We we get a park park and park commercial. This was this was really funny. Um, I watched it a few times. It's it's uh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting uh, Ethan Page to be involved with this, so this was this was pretty funny. Um, I knew that he had uh, shown up at the tapings. And uh, the picture that has surfaced online has him looking in the in the ring, looking real silly. And I, I didn't know what he was doing, and now it now it makes sense. He's kind of playing this um, corny character. So really curious to see what they do with this. If they're actually trying to build a tag team, or if it's you know I, I don't know what the goal is, but I just know that commercial was funny, um, and that's real humor. Not what they were doing at Thanksgiving with the food fight. Like that's not humor. That's silly. That's childish. Like. This is humor. This is actually funny. Um, I like stuff like this. You know, I, I, I always said since I come on this show that, you know, I like silly stuff. I can live with it in wrestling as long as it's done well. 
and this had like an 80s terrible vcr infomercial feel to it and that's fine going with that you know, and it kind of plays into the the Joseph Park character as well. So yeah, I, I don't mind someone being uh, debuting this way. Uh, obviously, it's only going to have a certain shelf life, but yeah, I'm quite happy with it. You know, I, he looks an interesting character, and and if they do more of these vignettes, that's good because it breaks us up from wrestling heavy shows. You know, it gives you something to to, to talk about. Yep, I can't wait to see more of it. Johnny Impact has an interview backstage, and um, he, he's just not a good talker, like. I've said this before, as a heel, he was always really funny and real um, witty, and as a babyface, he is the most dry, boring, says nothing. I've talked about Drew Galloway as a babyface, just, you know, talking out of the babyface handbook. Um, Eddie Edwards is the same way, you know, when it cuts his promos, it's just, it's just this white bread um, out of the out of the, the handbook, like I said, of babyfaces, you know, and... That's what Johnny Impact does too, and the Slam Town and everything. Like I know he's trying to get it to catch on. To me, it's just kind of corny. I don't dislike Johnny Impact in any way whatsoever. I'm very happy he's here, so I don't want to get that misconstrued at all. But these promos he gives are just awful. <laughs> uh, there's a question for you then, it, because when you think about the top baby faces uh, that you listed there, you know some of them have been very good. Who do you think who's on the roster at the moment should be in a top babyface spot then? Because I'm not saying Johnny Impact shouldn't, but he can't cut a babyface promo. So who do you think has got the chops to do it and could be in that top babyface? Um, who's got the chops to do it? You, you know, people give me a hard time for this all the time. Everyone, you know, most people know I'm a really big Braxton Sutter fan, and and people think he's this this dry character with no personality. Like this guy's an amazing talker. He just hasn't had that opportunity at all. Uh, okay. And he he knows how to fire up a crowd. Uh, I, I'm not saying he should necessarily be in a top spot, but I think he could just be in a much higher spot than than he's in. And I think he's very very underrated as far as um, charisma and um, and, and being a talker. Uh, I really think he is, but um, other than that, God, uh... I think um, you know just just you know to answer my own question. But unfortunately, the two other people who I think I'm talking about in a top spot, you know, not just a mid card uh, guy like Braxton. No, it's no disrespect to Braxton, but unfortunately, it's Eli Drake, and I think even Alberto did well in the face roll. Um, other than that, EC3, but once again, he's better as. Most of the good guys in the company, the people that we like, we don't like baby faces. That's the problem. Uh, it's very hard to get a good baby face who you like. We all like those ones with the shade of, you know, that that shade of grey, you know, the, the tweener, for, for want of a better phrase. And I think that EC3 and Eli Drake certainly can play that. Um, but a clean cut baby face, it's really hard to find someone who's good and can carry that off. I can't think of any. And, and maybe that's what they need to find is, is a top guy to come in who can do that. But I don't know who the top guy is who can. That's the problem. Austin Aries, maybe? I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think he's a must to come back. They really got to find a way to, to to bring him back. But the thing with babyface promos in, in the 2000, um, you know, probably since 2010 now, this whole era, um, they, they continue to go back to the white meat. Uh, white bread, uh, real simple. I'm gonna get you, and if you knock me down, I'm gonna get back up, and like um, that kind of crap. Because we don't talk like that as real people, and that's why a lot of heels, um, you know, like especially like with Eli Drake, really get over because he represents more of the conversation that people actually have on a day to day basis, and the whole um, wrestling baby face. People don't talk like that at all anymore. You know, you're a coward, and I'm coming for you, and so they've just got to find they ha the baby faces have to have edge to them too. That's just really what it boils down to. Just when you said about that representing the, the, you know the, not the common man, but well, you know, what people talk about, you know, it just reminded me of, of Dusty Rhodes, you know, his famous Hard Times promo. And thinking about it, most probably Cody Rhodes could have, could have been that person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he would have stuck around. He could have ironically have been that person who was the top baby face if, if he would have uh, stuck around. But there you go. That's why you know maybe. Maybe it's okay to bring, you know, bring talkers back to wrestling, managers who can talk and everything. I mean, it's, man, like, I, I thought that's our area where Maria really shined. I mean, then, then they over, you know, they overkilled it. But, I mean, at first, like, she was such a good talker with Mike Bennett 
And Bennett was a good talker too, but you know, I, th- I thought, what is going on with Mike Bennett these days? I know he's in the WWE, <laughs> but I, I haven't seen shit like online like that. He's even taken a little bit seriously. I think he, he was in a tag match last week. I, I think I read online, but she's pregnant, which let's face it. Most of the reason, probably the reason why he's been signed is more to do with her than him. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Um, uh, and if she's not on TV, then well, there you go. That's his push gone. But anyway, that's the other show. That's the other company, as yeah. Alberto would say. Yeah, exactly. I just, I, I, right as I brought up his name, I'm like, I have not heard jack shit from that dude. Um, <laughs> uh, so Matt Seidel, Tyson Dukes, we don't really know that Tyson Dukes is a part of the company. Maybe, may not be. Maybe just because it's in Canada, don't really know. Um, I, I don't like that they kind of built and they did the same thing with Casey Spinelli. Oh, she's really impressed, and he's really impressed since being a part, you know, being here on Impact. But all we've seen is like one match for them from them each, and um, you know they're trying to build them up off nothing. And you know we saw him at Bound for Glory in a match that. Laurel Van Ness was taking, you know, all the attention away from, and it was a very, you know, not a memorable match, but this match was good, and uh, I think Matt Seidel always does good work. I mean, I think I really think he always does. They've uh, they've name dropped the Cruiserweight Classic a couple times regarding Tyson Duke, so obviously anyone who's a part of that um, was a part of that tournament has a little bit brings a little bit of star power with them so if you're if you're going to bring this guy aboard you know give him give him something to do i mean the x division needs heels um you know and him and him and hakeem zane can can uh, slide into that very easily um idris abraham if he's even around but give this guy something to do i mean th- don't don't make him your jobber um but Seidel, it was a good match the only thing i didn't really care for was the the, the setup to the finish uh, you know, he kind of he kind of hit him with a high kick, a high knee strike. Um, it, not not really a match, that, not really a move that should floor somebody to the point that you can pull off a shooting star press after that, especially when it's on the opposite turnbuckle and you got to get all the way over that. It, it was just a little unbelievable for me as far as the uh, the finish win and everything. But EC3 was on commentary, so it seems like Tyson Dukes just keeps. Uh, Pulling up, pulling the short straws where whatever match he's in, there's someone going to be um, distracting him or being distracting of him. But uh, EC3 was on commentary, and I thought he did a really good job. And I've really liked when uh, you know uh, Jimmy Jacobs has been on commentary, and EC3 really added some personality that the booth doesn't have. So, uh, you got any thoughts on this one here? This was kind of the second X Division match of the evening. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Matt Sedell, uh, absolutely talented guy. His matches are always very good. Lots of high flying stuff in there, which is crowd pleasing. Really like him, but let's face it, he's at once again most probably tail end of his career, and he's going to be feuding with EC3. And I just don't get this feud. And nothing against the participants in it, but why are we putting Sedell on this spot? And I, I don't, I genuinely don't know. By the way, from the spoilers, whether he goes on to win it or or whether he goes back down to the X Division. But to me, there's so many other people who could be in this spot, you know, and Sadal should be X Division champion or around that match. You know, he shouldn't be in the secondary belt spot. I, I just don't get it. Uh, I really don't. But, you know, I, I, that's moving away from, from really the match. The match was, was great. It was really good. You know, all the matches on tonight's show were really quite decent, to be fair. But I, I just don't get this feud at all because it, it came out of nowhere. And I don't know why they've picked someone like Sadal to be in this spot when there's plenty of other people who could have been in the spot. I hear you, but I, I actually kind of like the pairing. It's so random that I actually am interested in it. I had to laugh when Josh Matthews tried to put over the Sony six way. Uh, I forgot what they called it. The Sony six way cup or whatever match uh, that Matt Seidel won in India. I don't even remember that match. I don't. Even, I, I guess there were six <laughs> six people in it. Um, that's about all I remember. Uh, I, I didn't even think he won that match. I thought Shira won it. Or <sighs> he definitely won a tournament out there. Yeah, he won something, and they try to make it sound like uh, you know, oh, he was on top of the world when he did that. Like, what the hell was that? So, um, like I said I completely forgot about it. 
um, you know, they don't even put over the uh, Super X Cup, so I don't know how they're expecting us to, to care about the Sony six-way Invitational. That's what it was, so. Um, but Matt Seidel picks up the win, as he normally does. You know, EC3 does make a point. He doesn't win the big one. Like, if you see Matt Seidel wrestle, he's going to win the match. It doesn't remember. It doesn't matter if it's one-on-one, -on -one, triple threat, six-way, 20-man, over-the-top, battle royal. Like, this guy's always going to win. But when there's some kind of title or stakes on the line, he always loses. But next week, we're getting a grand championship, Matt Seidel versus EC3. Um, Johnny Impact versus Alberto El Patron was the main event. Those are the first match I saw because, like I said, my DVR only only recorded the main event. A very long match, uh, and I was very tired. I actually, um, when I got back on the uh, when I got back home in Illinois, driving from Texas, uh, I I got back early in the morning, um, and this was the first thing I did was turn this on, and I was I was kind of struggling to stay awake a little bit, not because of the match, but just due to my travels. Um, but I, I, I kind of remember enjoying the match and I think El Patron adds a, a personality to the, the roster that we're just really lacking. I've said this, a f I've said this a few times and even, I even throw Johnny Impact in that there is a, a premium that comes from these former WWE guys that know how to work the big crowds. Um, cause then you get a smaller crowd and it's a piece of cake to them to work that crowd and to get um, reactions and everything. So I, th I think that is something special that he's able to bring. And I thought the, the brawl th several weeks ago was done really, really well. I thought that was excellent. And I thought they actually built up because normally if you just put these two guys on paper, I probably wouldn't have too much interest in the match, but they I think they really built up to it ver very well. And they even brought up, um, I don't know if they brought this up or Johnny impact. I think Johnny impact brought it up on a promo. Um, that they feuded in Lucha Underground too, and I was like, "Oh, you're right. You know, they did have something there." So, kind of gave us a reason to care. Uh, you got any thoughts on this main event here? Yeah, uh, fortunately, I, I agree with you, BQ, in that uh, I think Alberto does bring a premium to the product, and he has got that star quality. And whether you like him or not, whether you think that he's a top star or not. Uh, you know, to me, he does bring something that is missing at the moment in the main event scene. Now, I love Eli Drake. I think he's brilliant. But the the pairing with Johnny Impact has been a bit lackluster. And Alberto brings a bit of an edge to it. And, and that's what I like. You know, there's a bit of nastiness in him. And, and, and I just didn't think it was there with the Eli Drake versus Johnny Impact. Uh, so the match itself, like yourself, I was a bit tired. It was uh, about midnight here in the UK by the time that, that match was airing. So I was kind of trying to stay awake watching it but same kind of thing i quite enjoyed it um you know it was good it was a good match and uh yeah I, I, it would be interesting this uh, did they announce what what happens next it, it, did the winner get a title shot with uh, eli drake i can't remember no, it, was it, was just just like a, it was just like a grudge match right um so yeah so i, I mean it was good i don't think the feuds ended yet between these two but the problem with that is that obviously eli drake is is kind of in no man's land at the moment. Uh, I'm guessing it might go triple threat at some point. I have to believe that's where it's going too, because you know, yeah, you're right. No man's land. There's nobody, uh, there's no one to challenge Eli Drake otherwise. So good match though. Um, I, I, I kind of like the ending. Um, I like the way that he, I really thought El Patron was going to win this thing, but, uh, I think Johnny impact needed the win more, but the way that it ended where he kind of pulled himself up, uh, got that kick and then hit the sh starship pain. I thought that was excellent, and I really thought there was they did a good job with near falls with this match. I mean, I, I actually really liked it. Uh, just a little long for my taste, but but I liked it. Um, I didn't really like Eli Drake coming down. I mean, he kind of teased it in, earlier in the evening, and he's the champion, so you got to kind of have him on there somehow. But um, I just didn't like him coming down and almost acting acting like uh, Chris Adonis probably should. You know, coming down uh, just. It was just the the, the demeanor, um, and then doing the post match beat down, only to uh, you know, Petey Williams to come down and hit him with a Canadian destroyer, make the champion, you know, leave on his ass, and you know, technically Eli Drake was outnumbered, so it was just kind of a weird. Um, why would the champion come out there, start trying to attack these guys by basically by himself? I don't even remember if uh, Adonis was out there. I don't believe he was, but 
you know they're kind of they're kind of throwing Petey Williams in this little main event scene like they've been doing with the X Division guys where they're kind of teasing Sadell in there and teasing Garza in there and it's like I think they're just trying to appease the Canadian audience much like they did with Shira in India um, but I don't know any uh, any closing thoughts on this one on this uh, main event stuff yeah yeah it was just on the booking really and it's absolutely refreshing to see that they haven't put Alberto to beat Johnny Impact and then go on to the main event. I mean, I'm not saying that doesn't happen in the next couple of weeks, but it's great to see that they are, you know, backstage, if nothing else, are punishing him from for, for what he's done, whether it was right or wrong to punish him. But he has certainly tarnished the, the, the reputation of the company a little bit. So it's good to see that they haven't just put him straight back in the main event scene and pushed him as someone who's better than Impact and is going to go on to uh, Eli Drake. So, so well done, Impact, on that one. And as I said, you know, they'll most probably prove he's completely wrong next week and and he'll leave with, with the belt somehow. Um, so, yeah, so uh, I, I, overall, from top to bottom, the wrestling was excellent. There wasn't much progression storylines except for America's top team and, and a bit of Park, Park and Park. Um, but apart from that, it, it kind of washed over me, the show. And I have a worry with shows like this where they are wrestling heavy that if they wash over me, who's an Impact fan, it's not going to draw in a casual viewer. I, I do think you need more storyline led stuff. And at the moment, the product seems to be missing that. I'm okay with the wrestling and the less talk, but when they said less talk, I don't want that to be less creative. I just want less, you know, um, coming out. So they're in grabbing a mic and talking for 20 minutes. Like, I, and they don't do that a whole lot, you know, um, with the exception of Matt Hardy did it a lot when he was a champion, but they, they don't, they're usually not too bad about that. But it's really the talking segments that people don't want to see. That's why I really think just the backstage with Mackenzie Mitchell is, is, is fine. I think that's that's all it really needs for talking. Um, but I would like to see more creative. I'm okay with the, the wrestling-heavy shows, but, you know, let them lead to something as well. I think Jimmy Jacobs, didn't he come out with something recently saying that um, you haven't seen anything yet? What, what's about to happen or something? I don't know what they've got lined up. But, but he was making some noises about you know, it's going to get a lot more creative very soon. So let's hope so. Uh, you know, uh, it needs it at the moment. You know, there, there does seem to be a lack of direction in the programming and the feuds, but let's just hope that, you know, they manage to get something out there. That, that's good. Get yeah. people talking again. But from what I've, what, what I've understood, um, that Jimmy Jacobs is actually a really, really creative guy. That was, that was you know, a, a few of the good WWE storylines last year he was in charge of. So, you know, I hope that, yeah, I hope that's true. I hope he, he helps uh, bring something really good, really creative uh, to the table. And, uh, I don't know, just something different, something we, we don't always see. Yeah, so the only other thing I was just going to bring up, if you don't mind, was um, I hear that they are going back to Canada for March, is it, after the January tapings of the Impact Zone? I think I, I read that, but it's not going to be Ottawa. No, it looks like they're going to do something different. You know, they said they had a hard time uh, filling the stands in Ottawa, which obviously obviously they did. But, I mean, based off this show, I was I was happy with what I saw and what I heard. Um, yeah, obviously, I don't know a whole lot about Canada, but, um, uh, you know, they said it's not really much of a wrestling town in Ottawa. So, you know, maybe they, maybe they try something different and, and something that's a little bit more of a wrestling town. The one good thing that I'm uh, looking forward to is this next set of tapings. I know we always seem to say, I can't wait for the next tapings, next tapings. Uh, the good thing is there will be continuity this time. You know, the, the, the ship has stabilized a little bit, so it's not like we've got another new regime, so they can build on the last set. But the good thing is, is that I think we might get some surprises at the next one, just because people like Austin Aries, 90s day complete calls will be up, and people like that. So I think there will be a much more excitement around the next set even if it is in the impact zone i agree with you i really do all right uh that will do it for us guys this week talking impact wrestling so uh thank you for listening please hit subscribe and we will uh catch you next week peace